So the history of the English Bible is why we've come to, to learn about it. And actually, there are two groups that think that what I'm, I'm about to start doing, which is teaching Christians about the history of the preservation and transmission of the Bible, will actually result in the destruction of your faith. There are two groups that think that, that this is a dangerous thing and either it should be done because they would like to see the destruction of your faith or it shouldn't be done because they don't want to see the destruction of your faith, but they both think that it will. These two groups would agree on virtually nothing else. Come on in. Both, but both think that evidence and facts are enemies of faith. Evidence and facts. History. They think that stuff is what destroys faith. So let me tell you about the two groups. The first group would be skeptics, those that are either agnostic or atheists or both, and they're typ typified by men like Dr. Bart Ehrman. You might have heard of him. He's the author of Misquoting Jesus, uh, which just came out as a bestseller, and also How Jesus Became God. All right, so that's Bart Ehrman, and I'll reference him again later. But he would say, as a skeptic, that this information is going to ruin your faith. Or guys like Bishop John Shelby Spong, who wrote Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, would also say that the truth of history is the enemy of your faith. So that's one side. The skeptics don't believe that what we have today is the Word of God. And consequently, they reject all sorts of teachings in the Bible, especially the miracles like the virgin birth of Jesus, like the resurrection, like any implication that Jesus is in any way God, they toss all that stuff out because they don't believe that what we have today is the Word of God. The second group, who doesn't agree with this first group about anything except for this, are the fanatics who believe in a quote-unquote perfect Bible. They believe that the Bible that you have to have in front of you it must be completely perfect or it's no good. Uh, they are almost always, though, in theory, they wouldn't have to be, but they're almost always King James only advocates. People like Paul Ruckin, Ruck, Ruckman, Sam Gimp, and Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger, years ago, wrote a book called The New Age Bible Versions, uh, which sort of uh, started that whole thing rolling. These fanatics care nothing for evidence or facts, seeing them as unnecessary for faith. Instead, they put their trust in one translation of the Bible made 400 years ago and close their ears to the obvious corrections that can be made to that text today. And the reasons for that will become clear later on. By the third week, we, you'll know exactly what I mean when I say something like that. So if both the skeptics and the fanatics think this is a bad idea, why are we about to delve into the history of the Bible? Why shouldn't we just leave that to pastors? Let them know. Don't tell us about it. We don't want to know. We'll trust that they know, right? Why, why are we doing this? Simple reason. They're both wrong. The church should never be afraid of the truth. History and evidence confirm our faith. They don't destroy it. So that being said, we're going to talk about the history of the Bible, how it went from Moses, as it were, to Erasmus today, and then eventually to the Bibles we have in front of us. I have a quote up there that says, The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in it the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. That's an awesome statement, but if you don't have facts and evidence to back it up, then you're just taking that on faith. You know who that guy is. How do you know he knows what he's talking about? So confidence in today's Bible, this is what I'm going to try to share over these weeks, is it's not a matter of faith. It doesn't have to be a matter of faith. Faith tells us that it's the Word of God. That is a matter of faith, and it must be a matter of faith, that God inspired these words, that God is the author of these words, that the truths behind them come from God. Of course that's from faith. You could never prove that uh, empirically. But evidence, on the other hand, tells us that the same words we have today are, in essence, the words written by Moses and David and John and Paul and all the rest of them. So we're going to talk about two different stories here. We're going to talk about the story of copying and the story of translating. Because the history of the Bible is the history of those two things. It can't help but be. All right? You may not know this. Here, this might be a surprise to you. But the Bible was not written originally in English. <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute. Not written in English. One very important reason for that is the English language did not exist in any way, shape, or form when the Bible was written. There was no English. 
So obviously, translation is going to be a part of the process, but also copying. Copying from one manuscript to a new one in the same language. So we're going to talk a lot about, in the beginning, copying. And we'll get into great detail about the copying process. Now, the copying process is going to have some issues. How old is the copy we're looking at? Where does this copy come from? How accurate is this copy? And it's going to result in some textual issues that we will eventually talk about. For example, 1 John 5, 7 to 9. There is great variance in some of our Bibles on the text of 1 John 5, 7 to 9. It's not about the translation. It's about the copies that they are taking it from. And we'll explain why that is as we go. Or also the ending of Mark. You may notice in some of the newer Bibles they have the, this ending of Mark is probably not genuine to the original Mark. They have, a, they have a note there. Those are all copying issues, and we will deal with why those exist and where they come from. There is also translation issues when you go from one language to another language. Anybody who knows anything about languages knows that that is an art and a science together. It's a process. You have issues like this. Is it comprehensible? When you translate something into a new language, do they comprehend the meaning that you're going for there, or are they looking at you like they don't know what you're talking about? Is it accurate? Or does, and does the translator has a, have a bias? Maybe the translator is trying to shame things, or do they have an agenda? Examples for that abound, uh, starting in 1 Corinthians 13. Is 1 Corinthians 13 more properly translated as, translated as love, or should it be charity? Is there some serious uh, discussion about that? That's an interesting topic, and it ranges into translation. What does this word mean? What's the best word for it in English? Or in Romans, throughout the book of Romans, it, uh, the literal translation of what Paul is saying would be flesh. But in modern English, that just sounds weird, so some of the tra new translations have changed that. The NIV, in particular, calling it sin nature, trying to get at what Paul meant, and not exactly what he said. Those are issues of translation. We're not, argu not arguing about the text. We're arguing or trying to understand what it should be in English. Now, keep in mind that early translations of the Bible were made. All right? Before the time of Christ, the Bible was translated into Greek. The New Testament, very early on in its process, was translated into Coptic, Syriac, Latin, Old Church Slavonic, which I have no idea exactly what that looks like, and none of you do either, I hope. Lots of languages. So it's always been a process of translation. That's nothing new. Every Bible that exists in the world today in whatever language is thus the result of both copying and translating. It can't help but be. So let's start in the beginning. Evidence from copies. Here's something also that you may not understand, but once I explain it should be pretty obvious. There are no original autographs that exist of the Bible. Now, when we say autographs, you, you think, you know, sports star signing a baseball. Well, when we talk about the Bible and we talk about ancient documents, when we say autograph, we mean what the author penned with their own hand. That original piece of papyrus that they wrote on with their own hand. None of those exist to this day. Okay? There's very good reason for that. Time. Time destroys things. These things were made primarily, in, 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 or at least in the first century, on papyrus, which is like paper. It's made from, from reeds in the Egyptian, uh, in the Nile. They press them together they, they're, and write on them. Those are not going to last thousands of years. It's just inconceivable. They're not going to make it. So time is going to be a huge factor. The material's being used. Another factor for why we don't have any original autographs is deliberate destruction. Who knows how many documents of the ancient world have been destroyed on purpose by marauding armies, by uh, people that, that wanted you know, to destroy whatever it was. We have no idea sometimes how much we've lost. Some, there are some authors of the ancient world that we only know they wrote stuff because other people talk about what they wrote, but we don't have a single thing that they've actually written which is pretty sad. So deliberate destruction happened. And of course, ever-present tr troubles, especially in the ancient world, fire and flood. Fire was a huge hazard in cities of the ancient world. Pick an ancient city, and they've all burned down pretty much to the ground at one point or another. Uh, some of them more than once. And 
documents made of papyrus are probably not going to survive that very often. And also flood on the flip side of it. You get this stuff soaked and it's not going to be good for it either. So you have reasons why these have not existed. Now, something to keep in mind is that we find new manuscripts every day. And I'll talk, about, or not every day, but every year. So we could find something from the first century. Entirely possible that we could find something that maybe we couldn't prove that it was from Paul's hand, but, but maybe the guy was looking at what Paul wrote with his own hands when he wrote it. We might find some of that in the future. But what do we have, what we have today is what our uh, focus is going to be on. So what do we have from the New Testament? How old are, are our copies? How reliable are our copies? And how many copies do we have? Well, let's talk about the process of copying a little bit before we get to that. This is an example of the process of copying. So up here at the top, you have the original manuscript. Paul, John, Mark, Luke, whoever, what they wrote with their own hands. People started copying that. In the ancient world, the only way that you could get a copy of something was to copy it by hand. I mean, that was it. So you sat down and made a copy. And that copy was sent somewhere else on our map here. So maybe Paul wrote from Rome a lot of his stuff. So he writes his letter, sends it over here to Ephesus, sends it over here to Galatia, and it gets copied here. One of those copies gets sent down to Alexandria. A copy of that one comes over to Antioch. They make three copies there. Some of them, the copies are moving all over the world, the ancient world, multiple copies being made of multiple copies. Okay? It's not a straight tree where you have Paul's copy and then a copy from that, and a copy from that, and a copy from that. It's much more like a spider web. It just branches out all over the place in multiple places throughout the early centuries of the church. You have many different people making many different copies. We have copies from those first 200 years, which as we'll see when we look at the history of other ancient texts is exceedingly rare. There are approximately 124 manuscripts from the first three centuries. When, I, when you see the rest of the choices for ancient literature, you'll realize how significant that is. Now, the exact numbers and the exact ages of these things are sometimes hard to come by. Is that, was this one written in 100 or 110? Is it from 115 or 120? It's not exact signs as to what year something was written when you find one of these old documents. So some of the skeptics will disagree slightly on the dates, but they're not going to disagree with any of this. The things that I'm telling you today are the exact same things that a skeptic like Bart Ehrman would say. He just has a different conclusion to this same evidence. So we don't have the originals, but we have exceedingly old copies, and we'll look at those as we get going. How reliable are our copies? Well, I'll explain that more later, but we have more or less 95 to 98 percent when you compile the copies, when you compare the copies, you can eliminate the errors that exist in some of the copies. Because if you looked, as if you can see, this is in red, but it's hard to see. This guy made a mistake, right? It's supposed to be the, the only son of God, and he forgot the word only. So all the guys after him didn't know that they were forgetting the, the word only because the copy they looked at didn't have it. That's the kind of mistake that happens. So now, this is what we've got. We've got one from here and we've got one from here, and maybe we've got both of these, and a couple down here, and a couple over here, because the rest of them have been destroyed over time. Well, we can look at that and say, wait a minute, all of these ones have the only Son of God. This, these, this one says Son of God. That one says Son of God. We can piece it back together and realize what the error was that was made. Now, that's, of course, in English. These are all in Greek that we're talking about, but with English, we can illustrate the issue. So you've got copies down through the centuries. When you compare them, you start to see the truth unfold. And I'll explain that. I keep saying that phrase, but it's hard to, to get through this without doing that. 98% agreement. None of the papyri discoveries of the last 135 years. We have found a lot of new evidence in the last 35 years. But here's something amazing. None of that new evidence has changed a single, or has given us a single new reading that didn't exist in our manuscript tradition already. 
So they've uncovered scuff, stuff in the desert. They found things, industrial libraries that we didn't know existed. When they looked at those new manuscripts, compared them to the ones we've known about because they've been uh, available to the public for a long time, they didn't find anything that was brand new. We've never seen this reading before. What does that mean? They never had one of those moments. They could always say, this is a new one, yeah, but it's the same as those two over there that we already knew about. It's interesting, now we've got more evidence that maybe those two are closer than we thought, but it's not brand new. So how many manuscripts do we have? This number changes all the time. The, the current, more or less, closest number is 5,780. That goes from more or less the first century to the 16th or 17th century. The further along we get, the more in number we have. That certainly makes sense because there were more Christians making more copies, but also those copies are half as old as some of the other ones, <laughs> much more likely to still exist. <coughs> so we have approximately 5,780. In the last 10 years, they have found 70 new manuscripts. You think 70 is not that much, but those 70 were 1,800 pages of text. Now when I say a manuscript, I might be talking about something as small as this. Or I could be talking about something that is several hundred pages long, maybe even the whole New Testament. So it's hard to say when we're talking about number of manuscripts. That might not give you the full thing but I will tell you on the slide here in a minute how many pages of text that is total. So how does that compare to what we have from the ancient world? Let me flip to my other one moment, please. Let's look at some of the ancient things that we have. That's not going to show up at all unless I shut this off. Plato. The earliest copy we have of Plato is from 900 AD, that's 1,200 years after he lived. We don't have anything that tells us what Plato wrote for 1,200 years till after he, read, after he lived. Did you ever pick up a copy of Plato's Republic? I've read it, read it in philosophy. Then I didn't sit back and think, man, I wonder if this is actually what Plato had to say. Yes. Well, he, he, didn't, he gave you a half a fibber. It started at six. So uh, Sorry, come on in, find a spot. You're okay. That was his fault. There might be another guy coming in. <laughs> Herodotus, 1,300 years. Euripides, 1,300 years. Julius Caesar, 1,000 years. Notice the number of copies that we're looking at here. Seven, eight, nine, ten. It said 5,780 copies of the, of the New Testament. We're in single digits on some of these copies of guys that are famous, whose works are very important, and we're taking the word of somebody that wrote 500, 700, 1,000 years later that they have an accurate uh, rendering of what that person wrote. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's hard to say. Even Homer, the only thing that is even remotely in the same ballpark as the, of the Bible is Homer with the Iliad, the most famous work of ancient literature, copied all over the place. The oldest copy we have was written more or less 500 years after it came to its, its final form. And we've got about five, uh, six, what is that, 643 copies. They think they've got 95% accuracy of what Homer wrote. So Homer's in the ballpark, but you don't base your life, your life on what the Iliad has to say, right? So you care a little bit more about how accurate the New Testament is. The New Testament, we have our earliest copies less than a hundred years from when some parts of the New Testament was written. 500 years, 700 years, 1,000 years, or 100 years. It's not even a fair comparison. All right? So what does that mean about how the Bible compares to these other texts? So we have a lot more evidence of the Bible than we have of anything else of the ancient world. Let's look at... Uh, 
Oh, jeez. I already did that one. How come this is not working? I've done this a dozen times. I'm trying to get it to do the full. It's not that either. Because I can't scroll down when it's like this. And that's totally not going to show up. Unfortunately, the sun is, uh, is in the wrong place. So let's make some comparisons. Now, that it's hard to follow the manuscript jargon uh, because there's some weird letters and names of these different things. But let me see if I can help, help you out with some of this. P52 from about 120. It's a fragment of John. It's only a piece of John, but that's early. P90 from 180. It's another part of John. P104, P98, one. 100, 150 to 200, 160 to 200. Notice the early age of these. Now, we don't, those aren't complete New Testaments, not even close, but they're evidence that what we have later is related to what went before. Down in here into the third century, P64 is, Matt, is, is, a, uh, is part of Matthew, P46, We'll look at it later. That's Chester Beatty's uh, collection. That's most of the Pauline epistles from 200 AD. Most of John from 200 AD. I'm just look, reading down the list. 200 AD, half of John, most of Luke. 200 AD, Titus, etc., uh, etc. Et and, and it goes on from there. When you get into the third and fourth century, we er, the 300s, the 400s, the 500s, obviously the evidence is going to start to grow of what we have available to us. And I'm disappointed that that's showing up so unbrightly. There's not much I can do about it right now. The sun happens to be going down this time of year right behind you. Let me get back to the PowerPoint, it's much brighter. Variants just yet. So, actually, no, we will talk about variants. So, what's going to happen when you have copies being made all over the known world over a 15th century span is that you're going to end up with a lot of differences in the copies. Each of those differences is called a variant. If it's a one, a one word difference, a spelling difference, that's a variant. Now, a variant. Calling it a variant doesn't tell you how many of those 5,700 contain that. Maybe only one contains it, and that would be a variant. Maybe half of them contain one and half contain the other. That would also be one variant. If you add them all up, you come up with a number that at the beginning sounds like a bad thing. There are 400,000 variants in the New Testament. But there's only 138,000 words in the New Testament. That makes you, you think that for every word there are three choices. If it's very dangerous to go with things like statistics unless you start to understand what they actually mean. So let's keep going with that. 99% of those 400,000 have no impact on the meaning of the text. They are either people that can't spell. Have you ever seen people that don't know how to spell? Scribes and, and, and amateurs back then couldn't spell sometimes either. Word order. Maybe they flipped words around. Maybe they skipped a word. Maybe they skipped a whole line. They made common mistakes. Have you tried to copy the whole New Testament by hand? You'd make two or three mistakes at least of that nature. I'm kidding. You'd make a lot more. We all would. And there's, other, there's another thing that accounts for many, many, many of these mistakes in Greek. It's called the movable new. Think the difference between a car and an apple. Does it change the meaning if you mess up the difference between a and an? You're supposed to have an in front of a word that starts with a vowel, but a if it starts with a consonant. It's not the end of the world if you screw that up, but back then they screwed it up a lot. So when we start eliminating spelling errors, word order errors, simple mistakes that, any, that are obvious when you look at the text, things like you're copying down the Gospel of Luke, but you remember in your head what Mark said there, and so you 
harmonize accidentally. Or you can easily do that with Paul, right? You've got in your head what he said in Ephesians, but you're actually supposed to be copying Galatians or Philippians. And so you make that mistake. Once we start eliminating those obvious problems, we realize that 99% of them have no meaning in the, in the translation word. They're not even significant enough to impact the translation. So that leaves us with 1% of those 400,000 variants. The skeptic will say, there's 400,000 variants, only 138,000 words, and that's all he'll say. He'll stop there. He'll agree that, with the rest of this stuff too, but he's not going to highlight that for you. He doesn't want you to know that. 1% of the 400,000 variants gets us down to actually 4,000 meaningful textual variants. And I'll explain meaningful. Meaningful means that it impacts the meaning. That's what makes it meaningful. All right? If you spell a word wrong, it doesn't impact the meaning. Right? We can fix that. And in the end, the right spelling is not the end of the world on some of these uh, cities and people's names. That's not what, our, what we're worried about. So that means that for 138,000 words, only 2.9% of it is involved in real error, or real textual variance. That's once every three pages. That sounds a little bit better than three choices for every one word, right? Once for every three pages makes a big difference. Only half of those 4,000 meaningful variants are viable. And by viable, we mean they have enough evidence in the manuscripts, in those 5,780 manuscripts, that scholars believe that it has a chance of being original. So if I had one variant that was only found in one 15th century, 15th century manuscript, out of 5,780, only one guy copied it this way, it would be meaningful, because the way he copied it would really change the text. But what are the odds that that is the correct reading? when nobody else up until this point has had that reading. Zero. That's not the right reading. The guy just made a big oopsie. So it's not a viable and meaningful. So when you combine meaningful and viable, you're down to 1,500 variants. And you're thinking, 1,500 variants, that sounds like a lot. 1,500 places in the New Testament were not entirely sure if it's this reading or that reading. There's a choice. Sometimes there's three choices. Usually there's really just a couple choices that, it, that it's either this or this. You think that must be a lot. So what does the skeptic Barterman in his book say about that? This is his book in Misquoting Jesus. This is a direct quote. Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by the textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. He looks at those 1,500 and says, you know what? None of them affects the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection, uh, doctrines of baptism. None of, none of them affect what it is that we believe, what it is that we do. That's not the kind, it doesn't affect that for two very good reasons or for one very good reason, none of the key doctrines of the church are found in only one place. We do not build anything based on one verse, on one phrase, right? So if there's one that we're not entirely sure of that happens to be in 1 Corinthians, we say, well, let's not build a house on that one. Let's find the 14, 15, 20 other places the New Testament talks about this same topic and see what they have to say and go with that. We're never building on just a variant. Okay? Something else that happens in this... Ah, let me finish this. The more manuscripts you have, the more variants exist. Think about it this way. If we had one manuscript of the Bible, of the New Testament, one somehow survived, it was very ancient, would you have much faith in it? How do you know who made it? How do you know that they reflect what the apostles wrote. It would have absolutely no variance in it at all. But where would your faith in it be? You'd have to have 100% faith in whoever penned that one copy. The more copies we have, the more variance we have. So the reason we have so many differences in our New Testament text is because of the wealth of evidence we have. 
it is a good problem to have. Flip that around and compare that with the Quran. There are not textual variants in the Quran. You know why? Because one of the caliphs, the fourth caliph, Uthman, Uthman, I can't help, probably butchering the man's name, U L T H M A N. He got all the manuscripts together, collated them, decided what the text should be, and burned all the rest of the copies. So if you are a Muslim, you have to trust that man, because he decided for you what all of the readings should be. So many times if a Christian apologist is debating with a Muslim, he'll say, you've got variants, you've got variants. And I say, amen, we've got variants. Because that tells me that no one person ever had their hands on the whole text. And the reason for that will be obvious in a minute. So let's go back to those 5,780 New Testament Greek manuscripts. What does that mean, 5,780? The average length. I said some of them were just a little scrap of a couple of verses, right? Some of them are the whole New Testament. The average between them is 200 pages. So that's a lot of pages. 124 of them are from the first three centuries. And as, as I said, a skeptic, someone who doesn't believe in the New Testament, might say, well, it's, it's actually 87 from the first three. You know, they would argue that a couple of those are from the fourth century or whatever. It's not, they're not arguing the essential facts. 500 of them are from the first 900 years. So yes, the bulk, 4,000 or 5,000 plus, are from... 900 to 1600 from that later period, but a wealth of them are from the first half Far more than anybody else from the ancient world. What's our total? 1.3 million pages of hand copied text So if you were to look at it all Somehow if you had the magical ability to get it all together because it's spread all over the world in libraries and museums uh, and research centers all over the world. But if you could look at it all, it would be 1.3 million pages worth of text, hand copied, spanning 1,500 years, spread throughout all of Christendom, from all over the Mediterranean world, these copies were made. North Africa, the Middle East, Europe, Russia, all over the place. That is a massive amount. Let me put it into perspective. If we were to take the average amount of manuscripts that one of these ancient uh, Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, Livy, Plutarch, that one of these guys has, the average amount, it would be a stack about four feet high. If you put all of their manuscripts on top of each other, and you're thinking, four feet, that's, that seems like a good amount, four feet worth of copies of what they wrote. If we took the New Testament manuscripts, those 1.3 million pages, they would be a stack more than a mile high. Four feet more than a mile. All right? It's not even a contest. So let's talk about those textual variants for a minute. Textual variants do not disappear. When we saw in this earlier one, they don't normally, they don't disappear. Because this guy is copying off of this guy. He doesn't know what the choices are. He just copies what this guy wrote. So it gets copied, and it gets copied, and it keeps getting copied. Textual variants don't disappear from our record. They're tenacious. They stick around. But that is, and I will explain why in a moment, a good thing. Because it tells us that the original text is there somewhere. If we have three choices on a verse, we know that one of them is the original. If we've got two choices, we know that one of them is the original. We might argue, and scholars might argue, I think it's this one, I think it's that one. But you know what? One of them's right. Because they don't just disappear. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Kurt Olin, one of the recognized experts on the history of the New Testament from this last century, says this, the transmission of the New Testament textual tradition is characterized by extremely impressive degree of tenacity. Once a reading occurs, it will persist with obstinacy. It is precisely the overwhelming mass of the New Testament textual tradition which provides assurance of certainty in establishing the original text. One of the things these scribes sometimes do 
is if they come across something they're not sure about, they write the other thing in the margin. They say, I thought it was this, but they write it in the margin. These things just don't disappear once they work their way in. So one guy's mistake in the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, yeah, it's not going to disappear, but neither is the original. And that's what we care about. We care about what was originally written, because that is our doctrine of inspiration, that what was originally written was inspired by God. Now we have to get ourselves back to what was originally written. As we've seen so far, we have a much, much, much greater chance of that than anybody else from the ancient world does with any text. Let me give you another metaphor, another example that might help. If the New Testament text was a thousand piece puzzle that we were trying to piece back together, some people think that we are missing pieces. Maybe we've got 900 pieces, so we've got all these gaps in our puzzle. What a mess that would be, right? What's missing? What don't we know? It's missing. That's not what we have at all. Because it's of the tenacity, because of the fact that these don't disappear, what we actually have when we pour our thousand piece puzzle out is 1,015 pieces, 1,025 pieces. Now that would annoy me if I was putting a puzzle together, but eventually you can figure it out, right? This piece doesn't fit anywhere. Let me set that one aside and keep going, but I don't think this piece actually fits. It's more weeding out the extra, the mistakes that have crept in, than it is finding the original. That is the task that we have. The task of filling in the gaps. If you are a Greco-Roman literary scholar, you must fill in the gaps. Because there are tremendous gaps in what we know of what those guys wrote. It is virtually unheard of with the New Testament to have to do that. We have the choices in front of us. We simply have to figure out what they are. And as I was saying before, even a skeptic like Bart Urban agrees that not a single important doctrine of the church is bound up in all of this. So all this stuff that I'm telling you, they would say, oh no, it's going to hurt your faith. It's going to hurt. No, it's not going to hurt your faith. Because even if we weren't sure about all of those different places where we have variants, we wouldn't have to change a single doctrine. Even if we crossed out all of those verses and said, well, those ones we won't use, it wouldn't affect anything that we believe. Something else that's important about these variants, something that happened with the Bible that didn't happen, uh, that's a little bit surprising, that accounts for many of these mistakes, is that ordinary people copied their copies of the Bible. Regular folk, not trained scribes in the early centuries, regular folk. The older manuscripts have more errors in them because they weren't as good at it. They weren't trained in it. But that rapid spread of the text, to Antioch, to Alexandria, to Byzantium, to Rome, all over the place, spreading out in all directions, assures us of this. No one person ever had the power to gather them all back up and change them. To say, you know what? I don't believe in the deity of Christ. Let me get these back. Let me pull them all back together. I'm going to erase it and change it. It's impossible. They couldn't have done it because they... For one thing, they had no idea where all those copies were. And there was no authority, no power that had that ability. There were multiple intersecting lines of transmission. Going this way, going that way, back and forth. It guaranteed that the text could never be modified by the church. There, you guys know Dan Brown, right? Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code. In his crazy theory, he believes that, or at least in his book he believes, that the church, under Constantine, when he became emperor, got all of the manuscripts together and added the deity of Christ. Because he wanted that, and no, nobody before that believed that, but he brought them all together and, and did that. It's entirely impossible. By the time the church had power to harmonize the text, by the time the church had ecclesiastical power, remember the first three centuries, the church was not in charge of anything. All right? The, the, the empire was. The church was basically in the shadows, staying out of trouble, being persecuted later on. The church wasn't in, in, in power to do anything like that. By the time the church had that power, if it had wanted to, 
Some of those fragments that I showed you, P66, P75, they had already been buried in the sands of Egypt, not to be discovered for 2,000 years. And guess what? When we unearthed them, we realized, no, the church didn't add the deity of Christ later, because it was already there then. We already knew that, but prove them right. So it's, there is no conspiracy. There could not have been a conspiracy. Nobody had the power. So let me tell you the conclusion of Bart Ehrman about the New Te Testament manuscripts. He was asked this in a debate with James White, and I'll talk more about him later. He said, Bart, if you were to edit the Greek New Testament and put all the stuff in that you think is genuine and original, you're the skeptic, tell us which ones are the right ones, if you were to put that in, would your Bible agree or disagree more with the Nestle Olive text, which is the basis of some of these new ones we'll talk about later, the NIV, the NASB, the New Living Translation, would it agree or disagree more with that than the King James does with that? And he said, no. No, it wouldn't. Even if I had my way and put all the things in that I thought were the right readings, it would be closer to the text we have today than the King James is. All right. So, what's the big deal? I already read you his quote. Um, despite those positive assertions about the text, he still says this, if God didn't preserve all his words, he didn't want you to have them. So he basically says, if the original autographs with Paul's handwriting on them, if they don't exist, you don't have the word of God, forget it, it's over. That's the conclusion. He must not have inspired it if he didn't preserve it. You know what? That's not the view of the apostles. In case you're wondering, the apostles believed in not only copy manuscripts, but translated ones as well. Because most of the time when the New in the New Testament, when the apostles, when Paul are quoting the Old Testament, they are not quoting the Hebrew scriptures. And they certainly did not have the original ones left after all of those years. But even if they had, they weren't even quoting them. They were quoting the Septuagint, a translation made in the second century BC in Greek. So the apostles didn't believe that you had to have the original ones sitting in front of you to believe that it was the word of God. Because they are quoting it as the word of God. And they're quoting it from the Greek, not the Hebrew. It proves they believed in copies. It proves they believed in translations. All right. So what is a reasonable conclusion based upon the evidence? And I want to move on to actually looking at the history of the text itself. What is our, this is all the introduction, but we got to cover this ground so you know where we're going. A reasonable person would conclude this. The Bible has much older copies? Absolutely. Far more reliable copies and many, 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 many more copies than any other ancient text. The accuracy of the New Testament text, then, is not a matter of faith. It is established by evidence in every meaningful way we have the same words as the original authors. In addition, just to, to let you know a little extra information, we also have 10,000 manuscripts in Latin. Those aren't included in the 5,780. Those are a translation, but we've got 10,000 of those just if we want to check. We've got five, uh, excuse me, over 5,000 ones in other languages. I told you Syriac, Coptic, Slavonic. We've got 5,000 of those if you want to check their copy. A million quotations from the New Testament church fathers. Those are the guys from the first couple of centuries that most of us have never heard of, but they were important guys. They quoted the New Testament all the time. If somehow tomorrow we woke up and every manuscript of the New Testament vanished, we could reconstruct the entire thing from their quotations. It would take some doing. You know, you'd have to get them all and, and collate them all and figure them all out, but they're all there. They quote the entire New Testament. Last thing before we move to the, the, the Septuagint. Each book of the New Testament has its own textual history. It was not copied in this form. All right? 
It was the Gospel of Luke being copied and sent around. The Gospel of John being copied and sent around. Individual letters of Paul. As time went on, they started copying all the Gospels together. All the Pauline letters together. But they all have their own history. They were flying around the Mediterranean world for centuries. Copies going every which way. Which means that different books of the New Testament have a slightly different uh, number, or excuse me, a different number of extant manuscripts. And when we say extant, that means they still exist today. We can't co co count the ones that don't exist because they've been destroyed or lost. Those don't count. We only count the ones we have. Revelation has the most shaky text. Because we have less copies of that, and they have more significant variants in it. Which is not all that surprising. Because there's some crazy stuff in Revelation that a scribe copying might be tempted to say, uh, uh, right, <laughs> as he's going. On the other hand, Hebrews has what we call a very pure text, because we have tremendous copies of Hebrews, and they have a lot of common readings. So there's a little bit of difference. There's 27 different stories here. Eventually, they start copying the entire New Testament by the 4th century. But before that, it was this book, that book, this collection of books, that kind of thing. If you want to know a little uh, about Hebrews, that we have one from uh, an early copy of the Pauline letters that has Hebrews in it. Does that mean that Paul wrote Hebrews? No. It means the guy that copied it then thought Paul wrote Hebrews. Whether or not he's right or wrong is up for the scholars to argue about, and they still do, and will always. And new uh, doctoral thesis papers will be presented on a yearly basis about whether or not Paul wrote Hebrews. So let's talk about the text. Now, we've been talking Greek, haven't we? New Testament. We haven't talked much about the Old Testament, and we're actually not going to talk that much about the Old Testament for one important reason. Most of our arguments are about the New Testament text. When Lutherans and Methodists and Baptists and Catholics are arguing about something, we don't normally whip out Leviticus and say, see, it says it here, right? We're, we're not mostly in the New Testament with that. So the Old Testament text. The oldest we have is actually the Septuagint. From the second century BC, it's often called LXX. Anybody know the Roman numerals? LXX means 70. 70. Because legend has it that 70 men got together. They were brought together uh, by Ptolemy II, the ruler of Egypt. He was a descendant of one of Alexander's generals, after his death he took over Egypt, and he said, you know what, I got all these Jews in my city, in Alexandria. It would be nice if we had a copy of their scriptures in Greek. Get all the rabbis together, come up with a Greek translation of it. The legend is that 70, 70 of them each, each translated the entire Old Testament, and when they got together, all 70 of them agreed 100% on what it said. Uh, on how to put it into Greek. Now, obviously, that's not true, uh, because you can't do that. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's too hard to translate. You're going to end up with differences. So this is a translation of Hebrew into Koine Greek, which is the lingua franca, which probably doesn't help you any when I use another language's word to explain that Koine Greek is the, the, what people spoke. Average, everyday, regular person. It wasn't translated into fancy pants Greek. It was translated into marketplace Greek, regular person Greek. They did that on purpose. So the 70 scholars, they got together, they translated. Older than any surviving he Hebrew manuscripts. And we'll explain why in a little bit. So our oldest copies of the Old Testament are actually Greek. Go figure. They survived when some of these did not. That's, this is what it looks like. Okay? No punctuation, no spaces. It's a real joy uh, to figure out. This was utilized by the New Testament authors and the church fathers when they quoted the Old Testament. Not every time, but much of the time. They had absolutely no problem with that translation. They liked it. They used it. Other than the Septuagint, this is the oldest surviving copy of any portion of the Bible, more or less. This is the Nash Papyrus. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we'll talk about next, this was the only Hebrew of the scriptures that we had from before the time of Christ. This isn't actually 
the Bible. This is the Ten Commandments and the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the pious Jews say every day. So it's more like a worship aid. You know, it's in the pew, you all pick it up so that you remember if you're not familiar, you, so you don't uh, be the one person that can't quote the Ten Commandments when they're saying them together, so you don't embarrass yourself. That's cool. Now that's actual size. All of these I'm going to show you are actual size. Uh, this is one of the four fragments that they have of it. So before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is all we had from before the time of Christ. That's a run-up to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are huge. One of the most important archaeological finds of all, of all of history. Until Indiana Jones actually finds the Ark of the Covenant, he hasn't, I don't think. They hid it in the, in the government warehouse, so we don't know. But uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were created by the Essenes community. They were Jewish separatists. Think uh, militiamen hiding out in the woods, uh, planning to overthrow the government. Uh, they were not fans of anything that was happening in Jerusalem. So they said, we're going to go live in the desert where we can be pure and get away from you. And they made copies and copies and copies. No, I don't care. In, the, in 1947, Muhammad al, uh, Ahmed al-Hamad found some of these copies in a cave. They were hidden in a jar. That is actually something that Jewish communities do with old scriptures. They burn them or they put them in a jar in the ground. These ones, thankfully, someone put in a cave in a dry place in a jar. It's the only reason they survived for more than 2,000 years. The legend is that this kid was throwing rocks into the cave and heard pottery break and said, oh, that must be something interesting. He went up there, found it. We have copies of every book of the Old Testament from these guys except Esther and Song of Solomon. Somebody jump in there with an opinion. Why no Esther? These are separatists. These are radicals. It's about a woman. That's half of it. And it's also missing something. The holy name of God is not in Esther. So they didn't copy it. They said, nope, we're not putting that in there. Song of Solomon is not in there for a whole different reason. Why didn't they copy Song of Solomon down? Because it's about what? Sex. It's about sex. <laughs> Read it sometime. It's about sex. And they said, no, 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 we're not copying that now. None of that here. Those are the only two things missing. There are 900 documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls find tens of thousands of additional fragments. Some of it sacred literature, parts of the Old Testament. Some of it just grocery lists. Some of it just their average everyday writing. It all had to be translated. It all had to be preserved. This was a work of decades to get this thing ready. The frightening thing is that when they were originally putting some of the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments together, they did so with masking tape. Scotch tape, excuse me, with clear scotch tape. We'll just tape this together and figure out how it all goes. Modern archaeologists are going, ah, you don't do that. You've got to have you know, a dry environment with gloves on and all that kind of cool stuff. But that's what they did, because they weren't actually sure what they had originally. The Great Isaiah Scroll. This is actual size of part of the Great Isaiah Scroll. There are 14 scripts with 44 columns, or this, excuse me, this is columns 45, 4 through 46. On this page is the text that says, uh, da, 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 he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and quite um, acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, this is an important text for us. The scroll was written in the first century BC, except for a couple of scribal errors. This is almost 100% all of Isaiah. Except for those stupid errors that sometimes you make, this text is identical with the text that we have, the next oldest Hebrew text from 850 AD. More than a thousand years later, and the text is virtually identical. So the second reason, I said there were two because I knew there was, the second reason we don't normally talk about the Old Testament and textual variants is because the Jewish scribes were meticulous in their copying. They did all sorts of crazy things that 
would drive most of us nuts to make sure that they had an exact copy. Counting letters, all right? They did stuff that would drive you and I fatty if we were told to do this every time they finished the page, right? You'd be seriously, I didn't screw up, quit telling me to count every line, every letter. I, that, it would make you nuts, and then you would make mistakes. Ah, here's where it was, that's what I wanted. If you were, this is on a scroll, all right, not a sheet, they, these were on scrolls. If you unrolled it, it would be 24 feet long, 11 inches high. So unroll Isaiah, it takes 24 feet to get all of Isaiah, and that's what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What does it prove? It proves the accuracy of our Old Testament text. There is a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls from the first century BC, discovered in 1947. As you can see, there are parts that are got some issues. It's more than 2,000 years old. That happens, but it's pretty great. There is a fragment. This is a little bit closer. Now, you don't know this, but there are no vowels here. The vowels are little dots that are the bane of anybody that tries to learn Hebrew. Hebrew is fun to learn until they start teaching you about vowels, and that sucks. It does. There are no vowels in that, because they didn't need them. They didn't put them in because they didn't need them. They knew the text well enough that just seeing the cons consonants was enough that they could, under they could uh, read the Old Testament text. You're thinking, holy crap, that's <laughs> nuts. I couldn't do that. We have vowels today. <laughs> they were put in later. The hyperlink you can't see, but if, if you go on my blog and look at the PowerPoint, all these hyperlinks are on there. You can actually look at every bit of the Great Isaiah Scroll online. And as you hover over it, it will tell you what that is in English. It's so cool. Okay? We'll continue with the story of the Old Testament until we finish it. The Council of Jamnia in AD 100 followed the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army in AD 70. In AD 70, the Romans had had enough of Jewish revolutionaries and troublemakers, and war happened. And when they came into Jerusalem this time, they knocked every stone off the Temple Mount and threw them into the valley. They said, we're done with you twos. You've made us mad for the last time. That's it. You've got to figure that a lot of manuscripts of Hebrew got destroyed in that destruction. They burned the place down. All right? So that accounted for much of our loss of the Hebrew Old Testament uh, manuscripts in the scrolls. So in AD 100, a council got together of Jewish uh, rabbis and leaders, and they said, we gotta, we're going to confirm the Old Testament canon. These books are in the Old Testament. That time, at that point, they decided the Apocrypha, those books from in between the Testaments, uh, they didn't include them. That's not an end to that debate, but it's an interesting thing that they decided that. They decided they revealed something else. When new copies were to be made of their scrolls, because the old ones were worn or tattered, you had to either bury the old ones or burn them. Historians cringe, because we would love to have some of those old, tattered scrolls. We'll take them from them. We'll say, that's okay, we'll keep them safe, we'll treat them nice, we want to study them. But they didn't, weren't thinking about what would people want 2,000 years from now. They're thinking, these are the sacred scriptures. These are the holy words of God. They can't fall into disuse. If we're not going to be using them in the synagogue every week, then they need to be destroyed or buried. Which is why our copies of the Old Testament are not very old until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important. We didn't have anything from older than 850 AD. So if you pick the oldest parts of the, New, of the Old Testament, you're, you're talking more than 2,000 years after it was written, when you get to 850 AD. To, a, to a, the, the minimum time would have been about 1,200 years. That's a long time. And that would have been, that's, that's kind of frightening. But when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, compared it to what they had from 850, we realized we didn't have anything to worry about. These guys were awesome. 
They are copying geniuses. The Aleppo Codex. Codex just means book. It's a complete Hebrew Old Testament with the vowels in the 10th century. See these little things here? Vowels. The Masoretes decided something. Too many Jews living in the diaspora. Too many of you don't have Hebrew as your normal language anymore. Your knowledge of the scriptures is not what it should be. We better put the vowels in. So they went back and put all the vowels in. Are there some textual variants because of that? Yeah. Because when you add vowels to a bunch of words with come with, that were just consonants, you might think, is it read or read? Is it, uh, oh, how many different examples can we think of in English where just adding vowels to the same continents would give us different words? A lot. <laughs> okay. So there are some textual variants based on that, but they went back and they added in the vowels. So now when we look at Hebrew, uh, our Hebrew scriptures, they have the vowels back in, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, even though they're a pain, it would be difficult uh, to decipher without them. You can look at the whole Aleppo Codex online as well. Our first complete Old Testament with the vowels from the 10th century. Let me stop, take a half a break, and ask if there are questions. I've covered a lot of ground, I know. And we got 20 minutes to go. I want to just start on the story of our Greek text. But if you have a question, now would be a good time before I go further from where I was when you thought of it. Yes, Joe? Who's seized to the preservation of all of this? Who sees to the preservation? Of all of this stuff you're talking about. These manuscripts today are scattered all over the world in museums like the British Library, in the Vatican. The largest manuscript archive is the Vatican today. The second largest is the uh, Monastery of St. Catherine in the Sinai. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is later. But they're all over the place. Uh, universities, libraries, museums, uh, private collections, uh, they are spread all over the place. If you are one of these manuscript guys, you are getting your frequent flyer miles to go and study them. Fortunately, much of this stuff is available online now. It's being scanned digitally, which is awesome, and put online. So that regular folk that don't have the wherewithal to fly uh, to Egypt or Israel or Rome can look at this stuff. Any other questions before I uh, transition to the Greek the story of the Greek text? Quiet group. All right, we'll see if I can get, make a little more progress on the Greek text this morning. This is the Greek text, the way it was copied until the 4th century. All capital letters, no spaces. Scott's up here in the front trying to figure out what text that is. I, I give you kudos for that. That is not easy. No, you're looking at that and thinking, I, I see some of those letters. I recognize some of that. You, know, you weren't thinking that at all when we were looking at Hebrew, were you? Uh, uh, he, he, the Hebrew script has absolutely no connection to our script. <laughs> all right? Greek does. All right? Greek is sort of an ancestor of what we have today. So you can see some things that look like O's and H's and Y's and C's, and you think, I might be able to work with this. In that sense, Greek is much easier to get started on, at least, because you don't feel like you're completely scared. No spaces, no punctuation, all capitals. Interesting, eh? And of course, that would lead later to some textual variants, because you might be thinking that this is the end of the word, and this is a sec separate word, but maybe this is the end of the word, and it was that. You know, and you, you screwed it up, uh, because you weren't sure about that kind of thing. It's fine as long as everyone keeps copying this way, because you need to copy, you just copy the same thing. Unfortunately, later on, they switched to a different style. This is P46 from the, Je the Chester Beatty uh, collection. Uh, da, 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 da. These are three portions of the New Testament. Uh, where's what the, the, the ah. 30 of the original 110 leaves still exist. All right, in the first codex, in the first book. 
Uh, this is from between 175 and 225 AD. Very ancient, very old, 150 years after Paul wrote his text, we've got some of it right here. All right, 85 leaves of another one still exist. In other words, th this one right, right here that you're looking at, this right here says cross Galatas to the Galatians. That's the end of Ephesians and the start of Galatians. All right, actual size. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that when they discover, they're looking at and saying, hmm, let's, you know, look at that, make sure we, we analyze it properly. And you can all look at these later. I'll tell you where I got them from later as well. So we start with Umgil's uh, capitals, and then, of course, they switch to cursive, and they make it minuscule. Most of us probably did that somewhere around third grade, figured I don't have to write those big capital curse or block print anymore, now I can do that fancy print. Didn't do me any good, because you can't read my uh, either of mine. But notice that is obviously cursive, uh, and it's much smaller. That beginning of about the 600s, they start writing that way, which is where you're going to end up with some textual variants, because now you've got to decide where to put spaces between the words. Uh, and so you might think that that was one word, but in, there, in reality it was two. Not the end of the world, because we can figure that stuff out later. Uh, but that accounts for some of them. Also, just to have to show you the kind of stuff that is out there. Nope, not ready for that yet. Okay. Uh, this is from 463, written by a deacon named John. Why do I know this? Because this is the oldest copy of any part of the Bible where the scribe dated it and signed his name. <laughs> Nobody did that. They didn't date it. They didn't say who wrote it. They didn't say where they wrote it. They just copied the thing. But for whatever reason, this guy said, you know what? I'm going to put my name on it. Now, this is not Greek. This is Syriac. And this is the language of the people. This is a translation into the common tongue of the people living, living in Syria at the time. Uh, originally, they had a harmonization of the Gospels that they, they put into Syria. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. But that would be cool to decide how they tried to harmonize the Gospels. Um, so that's only important from the fact that this actually can be dated, and we know who did it. Uh, I'll keep going with the story, I don't want to get you too far afield. But let's talk about the three codexes. Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus. And I probably won't get through with the, three, the story of all three of these. These are very important. And then wherever I don't go, we'll pick it back up next week from there. Let's talk about those. So Codex Vaticanus. This, this is a, in book form. So it's a codex. It's not individual leaves anymore. They were originally bound. Off in the day, some of the leaves are missing because that's what happens. This is from about 350 AD. And it's in what we call the Alexandrian text type. A quick explanation of what that means is that over time, the copies that were being made here in Byzantium, here in Antioch, here in Alexandria, and over here in Rome, started to sound like each other. They can be grouped now into what we call text type families. So that if you're an expert, you can look at it and read it, and when you come to a variant, you can say, oh, that's Alexandrian, because that's the way they were copying it down there. Oh, that one's from Byzantium. All right, that comes into effect later, and we'll talk about it more later. But this is from the Alexandrian text type. So our oldest major portion of the New Testament was found and is from this area. Now, it's called Codex Vaticanus for a very good reason. It's in the Vatican Library. It's been there since 1475. We have absolutely no idea where it was before that. But it, it's listed in you know, the librarian's uh, notes or whatever in 1475. Uh, it's been there since then. It is the oldest nearly complete Bible manuscript. It is missing the pastoral epistles and revelation. But for all that, it's quite a bit. It was used extensively by Westcott and Hort, and I'll talk about Westcott and Hort uh, probably on the third week, in 1881 when they did their research. This was written in 350, but this is not going to be part of our story until the 19th century. 
because it's more or less lost for all that period of time. They, it turned up in 1475, but it was not available for use until much later. So keep that in mind. We have that now. It is available now. Notice how so he wrote some stuff in the margins, right? He made some, probably a correction there. Uh, did some fancy stuff up at the top. So let's talk about Codex Vaticanus a little bit more. This is actual size. This was, the, this was made at the same time that the Emperor Constantine said, I want you to make 50 copies of the Bible. Before Constantine came to the throne, there was much persecution of the church. Many manuscripts were destroyed. He felt bad about it, and he said, you know what, we need some new ones. Make 50 copies. Now you're thinking, 50? That's not much. 50 copies? I'd go to the bookstore tomorrow and get you 100 copies. In the ancient world, 50 copies is a big deal for the emperor to pay for 50 copies. Because it's going to take a long time and a lot of money to make every single one of these. All right, the amount of vellum, the amount of animal skin that was used for it, very expensive. The amount of man hours. So this is a major investment on Constantine's part. It's believed that this might be one of those 50. We're not sure. Uh, in the 19th century, it was uncovered, and people started to uh, study it. We're going to talk about Erasmus next week. Erasmus wanted to look at this text. He wasn't allowed to. For the simple reason, the man was not in Italy, and he would have had to go into the library in Rome, and he would have had to get permission to look at it, and he didn't get it. So he didn't. He never had a chance to look at it. <coughs> so it's not like it was hidden, like it was you know secret kind of thing. He just didn't get a chance to look at it. All right. Uh, this is the end of Second Thessalonians, the beginning of Hebrews. Something interesting happened on this particular one, which I find interesting. Uh, a scribe from the 13th, 13th century. Uh, on this right here, and I have actually the exact same page up there of, of all things. He, that in the margin is the scribe writing this about Hebrews 1.3. He corrected what, an er what the earlier scribe had wrote, and he wrote this in the margin. Fool and knave, can't you leave the old reading alone and not alter it? <laughs> so the scribe in the 13th century said, whoever you are, you were, and he put it in the, right in the text, you were an idiot for putting that that way, and I corrected it, <laughs> basically. And he had the joy of calling him a fool and a name, uh, whatever the uh, Latin, uh, or actually, no, it's, I'm looking at it here, it is in Greek. So he insulted the man in Greek, which is awesome. That is Codex Vaticanus. Now, you will hear more about Codex Vaticanus late, later, and it will be vilified by people that hate the Roman Catholic Church because it's called Codex Vaticanus. That has nothing to do with the Vatican. That's just the library that it's found in. All right? That's just a name. They had nothing to do with the, with the uh, creating of it. But that's the kind of... Uh, topic that we're dealing with, and sometimes people's, uh, shall we say, passions run ahead of their logic. Codex Sinaiticus, also from about the same time, this was literally unknown until 1844 when it was discovered at the Greek Orthodox Monastery of St. Catherine in the Sinai, in the Sinai Peninsula, in the middle of nowhere. That monastery existed since the, I believe it was the 300s, it is the oldest continuously uh, run monastery in all of Christendom. It survived behind the lines, as it were, of Islam to this day for, for 1,300 years. These guys have been there a long time. A man named Konstantin von Tischendorf, and I'll tell you his story when we get to the 1800s, but he found it and brought it and looked at it. It is also Alexandrian text type. So it is not a direct descendant of Vaticanus. Neither of them are a direct descendant of each other, but they are like cousins. They are related in the copying process. If you have that big web of copying, they would be related somehow. We can tell that. Uh, it contains the Old Testament after the Pentateuch, after the first five books, and all of the New Testament. Since the 1970s, they have found some of the parts of 
the first five books. And I'll tell you that story later when we get to the to the twenty or to the eighteen hundreds. These two together may have been two of those fifty Bibles. We're not exactly sure, but it's in a slightly different format. This is also actual size. All right, in four columns. But if you're copying it by hand, there's no standard for how big the piece of paper's got to be or how many columns you have to have. So they're going to have some variety in them. There were originally 730 leaves, 730 pages, with the New Testament, the Old Testament, plus, plus the, epistle, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas, two later writings of, of Christian authors. 347 of them are now in the British Library. Now this is, you, Joe was asking, what happened to these? Who keeps track of them? 347 are at the British Library. 43 are at the Leipzig University in Germany. Six of them are at the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg. Twelve plus 40 pieces are at St. Catharines. So where is Codex Sinaiticus? Depends on which part you're asking. Uh, it's in different parts, but now it has been digitized and you can look at the whole thing uh, online. This page here is Luke 24. Uh, so, also cool. This one was completely out of circulation until we get to the 1800s. Nobody knew it was there. I mean, the monks knew it was there, but the monks weren't exactly uh, communicating with everybody else about things. That's uh, why they were hiding, or why they were living in the desert, because they wanted to be left alone. Uh, just enough time. We will end after Codex Alexandrinus. So they called that one Codex Sinaiticus, because it was found in Sinai. Codex Alexandrinus, uh, probably because it's my, mostly Alexandrian text types, but it is an interesting thing. It is, it contains multiple text types, which tells you how crisscrossed those webs of copying were. The Gospels read like they were copied from Byzantium from Constantinople, Istanbul, pick the name that, that's current. The rest of the New Testament reads like it was copied from the copies from Alexandria. It's a fascinating thing. So whoever made this copy had the Gospels probably in a separate collection of the Gospels, and he copied it from a Byzantine source. The rest of it he had from an Alexandrian source. And of course it is a Septuagint in the Old Testament. It has its own story as well. It was brought by the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch, Cyril Lucaris. He brought it from Alexandria to Constantinople and gave it to Charles I of England in the 17th century. So if you go today to the library, in, in the British Library, and you have access because you are a scholar, you can see their portion of Codex Sinaiticus sitting next to Codex Alexandrinus in the same room. But it had, that's the story that Alexandrinus has because it, it went from the, old, or from the uh, patriarch to the king of England, of all things. <laughs> they gave it as a gift. Uh, this is from the 5th century. These three texts have been very influential in why we have a difference between the King James Version and the modern translations. I will explain the rest of that story later, but these three are influential in that discussion. Largely because they were not available and were not being used when the King James Version was made. This wasn't in England until the 17th century. They couldn't consult it. Vaticanus was in the library and nobody could look at it. Uh, St. Atticus was in the desert. Nobody knew it was there. So the King James authors didn't ignore them. They would have loved to have seen them. They didn't have them. All right? It was the 1600s. If you wanted to go to Sinai, you had to get on a boat and go six weeks and spend time and try to look for something. It's not, it wasn't like it is today. All right. Two other things, just a couple other things just to wrap up before I close it up. Just before we get to the story of the Bible in Latin, it was also being copied in Egyptian, in Coptic. There are Copts in Egypt to this day, sadly not as many as there were before because of recent persecution. But they were copying it and translating it into their language. It was translated, as I said before, into Syriac, 
because there were Syrian Christians, and there are to this day, although they have had a rough couple of years. So the Bible was being copied and translated all over the place, and they were had no issues with doing that. Most, all of the story that what we're talking about now is a story of individuals. One translator, one copyist. Later on, we'll start talking about stories of committees and groups of people. But right now, we're, all, we're still talking about individuals. Questions at this point? I know that.